Hello, internet community. Thank you so much for joining us here at Pasadena Humane. Today, we are gonna talk about wildlife in watercolor. So the fabulous Ms. Lonnie is going to teach us how to paint some vultures and quails. And the amazing Miss Lauren <laughs> is going to give us a plethora of facts about them. Isn't that right, Lauren? That's correct. All right, so ladies, are you ready to get the show on the road? Super ready. Let's do it. All Thanks. right, before we do, I'm gonna go over some webinar reminders with everyone. Okay. okay, so if you guys have joined us before, which I'm hoping most of you have, you can see and hear us, but we can't see and hear you. So please use the chat box on the right hand side of the of your screen and try not to raise your hand okay like i said we are doing wildlife and watercolors we're going to learn all about vultures and quails you can join us next week as we read stay at home dog by danielle and tristan Pollock, and we'll learn all kinds of uh, fancy vocab in regards to this pandemic Oh, back up. Um, after that, we're going to be doing talking about bear and deer in another watercolor session. Join us for our upcoming programs. We've got lots to do on veterinary health and video learning. We're going to be talking about careers in animal welfare starting in October and something for our little ones. So if you've got younger brothers and sisters, they can join us for circle time. If you guys want to share your artwork, and we hope that you do, please use this link um, attached, and I'll go ahead and put it in the chat room as well. So if you miss this recording, any part of this recording, or you just want to go back and watch it again, it is recorded, and it will be sent to you tomorrow. Without further ado, we're going to have Miss Lauren and Miss Lonnie take it away. Hey, Lauren. Hi. <laughs> How you doing, friend? Good. How are you today? Good. I'm excited because we get to talk about the world of vultures and quails, something that I'm not very familiar with. So I'm kind of excited because I think we're going to learn a lot of really cool things. And before we get started, um, I'm sure you guys received our templates. This was just my hand-drawn version. So make sure to have that ready. And we're going to cut that out in a minute. We also need you to have prepared some watercolor brushes, like I've said uh, usually, is that these are very specialized brushes, have different sizes and thicknesses. So if that's something you dig, then I would totally say get into that and order these on Amazon or some somewhere in that kind of way. I have my cool little watercolor tray. Um, these are actually all the colors I'm going to use for today. But feel, please feel free to freestyle all of your colors, um, how you would like your quail and your vulture to look to look like. Before we get started, I'm going to cut my quail out. And I think I've said this before, and I'll say it again. If you guys have older brothers and sisters that can help you cut it out right now, or if you are on your P's and Q's and you actually already did this, good on you um, but when you are cutting out if you are uh, younger or even older it's always best to kind of cut it out in a small circle to kind of limit the amount of paper that you actually have to get through I'm actually using watercolor paper to cut this out so I would also recommend printing it on watercolor I mean uh, on some sort of cardstock so it's easy to use as a template which is something I haven't really said before but kind of what I do um, so as we're cutting this out Lauren, I know that we we both, I, I just saw quails recently, actually. I was in, um, I don't know if they were quails per se, but we had talked about this is um, around Joshua tree. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that we said that there are similar but different uh, quails out there. Is that true? Yeah, there's desert quails. They're usually the Gambles quails. They're named after this guy named Gamble. And uh, and they look very similar to our California quail. Um, and they just have slight differences in markings. Um, and and uh, the main difference is just kind of where they hang out though. 
Um, like you said, there's ones that like to hang out in the desert and those are the gambles quails. And then the ones that like to hang out in more like the chaparral and sage, sagebrush and kind of the foothills. Um, those are usually our California quail um, and sometimes even the mountain quail too. So we got a couple different kinds of quail around the area, um, but you probably That's saw the gambles. Yeah, they're beautiful. And it's so funny because they all look actually pretty different um, just in terms of their their plumage and sort of the things that <clears throat> their size even, I felt like they were slightly different than the ones I've seen for us closer. Um, and then the they vulture. Kind of look, oh, oh, go ahead. They all, all kind of look like little bowling balls though. <laughs> they're so cute though. Oh my gosh, they are so cute. I'm like actually really excited to talk about them because I feel like we don't really talk about these these animals specifically very much and they're around they're just kind of not around exactly where we are in the same places i mean we're going to talk about it but <clears throat> uh before we get started on that you guys i'm actually going to show you the versions that i worked on before we got started so i'll probably have them lined up next to the work i'm working on just so if you guys want to refer to them but if you don't and you want to do your own thing no problem this is a very traditional looking kind of bird uh watercolor but this one is not. I was kind of going down the Alaskan sort of tribal vibe. So if you don't want to do this, no problem. You can go ahead and fill it out as you'd like. <clears throat> and before we get started, we're actually going to outline these uh, templates onto my paper and we're going to do them together. So like I had said, we are going to work with um, watercolor paper or cardstock. It makes life a lot easier because if you were to use um, just a regular sheet of paper, it'll suck it up and it just won't it won't uh take to the color as well we want to make sure that we have really vibrant bright like bright artwork for sure so as you can see i'm just outlining this we're going to do this for both designs and then after we are actually going to do the inside detail work before we actually paint so you guys have something sort of to guide you i kept the feet very sort of abstract because i want you guys to be able to just kind of draw out your own feet so for example, the quail here, his feet are very sort of abstract. So I just used a brush and kind of decided the way I wanted his feet to look. So that's kind of why he looks the way he looks. So before we get started, I'm gonna put them side to side so you can kind of understand the line work that I did on here. So first off, what I would like you to do is you're gonna take the very top right here where kind of his head starts and you're gonna draw like a little face cover just like that. So you can see that's kind of what I did here. And then a line that kind of goes across here. And then it's another line that kind of goes down here. Now you can look at it and take a moment to do that. Then the next part is we're gonna take his kind of his wing area and draw that out and feel free to freestyle that how you'd like. And then there's like a little tufty area here that I did. So I think I'm just gonna do a little light line here. So I know that the tuft area starts there. And then he has really big eyes. So we're gonna just go ahead and draw his big eyes, his almond shaped eyes here, and then finish his beak off just like that. And that's pretty much all the simple line work I want for the quail. So there you go. And then we're gonna go to the vulture <clears throat> and we're gonna do the same thing. Here's my little stencil template, whatever you wanna call it. And I kinda still want him to be the same direction. So like, I'm going this way and I think for some reason because I'm right-handed for some reason it feels easier <laughs> this way but you can go ahead and draw it however you'd like I really like this one I like very tribally designs it's my thing so okay there you go now this one's really fun because this one you can actually draw it however you'd like on the inside but I'm going to make it easy I'm going to start with his really large eye because that's pretty obvious that I kind of want to give it a tribal look and that's definitely kind of the look there. And then as you can see, the black sections, I'm just gonna draw out black sections of where I, I want the black to start and stop. So I can do that. And then he kind of has like a little belly area. So if you'd like to just draw a circle or sort of the shape that outlines this area, kind of like that. And then this is kind of where his wings, his black wings start. So I'm just gonna draw a line here and then I'm gonna draw another line here. But as you can see, I really like the red sort of plumage and the wings down here. So I'm gonna go ahead and if you can see, 
I actually, I don't know if you guys can see that, but the line is still here. You can always erase the pencil lines after you're done. So I'm gonna go ahead and just leave it that way because it's not really a big deal <clears throat> that it stays that way. And then I just did this like funky little strange shape. So feel free to do your own shapes, triangles, squares, circles, anything will kind of go with the theme of this like tribal, tribal vibe that we have here like that. And then I'm gonna go ahead and leave that because I'm gonna color that in later and see how I feel. And then I think I'm just gonna do a square this time. And I'm gonna leave it open. So we're gonna go ahead and just leave that open. And then I'll just do it while we're talking. Anyways, I'm really excited, Lauren, because vultures are awesome. And <clears throat> I know that a lot of people don't see them a lot or really talk about them. So where are they usually located in, in our in our environment? Uh, great question. I was actually out of town this past weekend and I was so excited because I saw so many turkey vultures. It so was cool. like the best weekend ever. Um, but I Which was cool. driving, I was driving out to Arizona. So they're all over the desert. Um, they really thrive in those environments. Um, but to be honest with you, I've seen them just driving on the freeway, like on the 134 heading west or like or over by the two freeway. I don't know if you guys listening know your freeways, but it's all kind of around the foothill areas. Um, and and I've seen them. I've seen them circling around around there as well. So um, they are native. Um, to our environment here. Uh, like we've mentioned in previous uh, watercolor workshops, we actually do live in a desert, believe it or not. Um, and so they are a, a really important part of our ecosystem here um, as they, as we'll talk about when we sort of dive into to the, to the um, nitty gritty of what they, what the turkey vultures are really into. But um, they, they pretty much hang around wherever they can get food, just like most wildlife. Um, and so, I mean, what, when you look at this bird, what do you think it eats, Miss Lonnie? I mean, I think it eats whatever it can find because it looks pretty rugged. And the, I know this is like a very folky look, and I know that we're going to talk about some folklore and really cool stuff about sort of um, how neat it looks almost prehistoric this one and I know that they all kind of do the birds in that way they just look really rugged and rough and just mm -hmm. very specific like you when you see them you can't deny what they are and I think that's yeah. what's really cool is you, they're not confusing you know I, I think sometimes we talk about certain lizards or even people that don't know the difference between like crows and ravens um, and just like very specific things where if you don't know the little details on some of these animals they kind of could blend in a little bit together but the vultures are very much like their own independent style and just they just have a very independent vibe on them i love it yeah i think they're so cool there so their wingspans actually can be around six feet so that just kind of gives you a yeah. gives you a picture of actually how big they are and um, when they fly, they kind of hold their wings up a little bit higher than their head. So it's like a V and, yeah. um, and they, they'll eat mostly dead animals. And they, like you said, they're kind of take what they can get. They are, um, some people refer to them as buzzards, scavengers, lots of different names that have kind of not so great um, associations with them. Yeah. But they're super important in our environment because if we didn't have animals that um, ate, you know, the, the animals that have died, then that would cause a lot more diseases being spread and, you know, all those kind of bugs will just start taking over and, um, and then we have a bunch of roadkill, right? And we don't want that. It's not super fun to look at. So we're, I'm very grateful for for our um for our turkey vultures and um mm -hmm. and I think they're super cool they actually can swoop up to 60 miles an hour even though when you see them they kind of look like they fly slow and awkward um but they have really good eyesight and they can spot dying or recently dead animals from really high up in the air which is cool as well that's wild that they can see it like that. I guess their eyes are just so big and just like they can 
it's just amazing. And I really like that you brought up the word buzzards because you're right. I didn't realize that they were the same animal when they refer to them in that way. And you're right. Buzzards are always like, like they always look, look at these kinds of animals. Like they're not as important or they're not as cool or they're just gross because they pick up kind of the remains of other animals. But if it, if it weren't for them, I mean, everything would just, things would just wouldn't process in the same way. Our areas wouldn't be as clean. And mm -hmm. it's just a really great kind of circle of life that we're talking about right now, which I really respect, which is really cool. Yeah. And so, they're also, they are, there are some gross things about turkey vultures that oh, I think, I think it's kind of funny though. Um, they, one of the like very interesting kind of, some people might think it's gross things about vultures is that when they get bothered, so if there's an animal that's coming and like trying to harass them or disturb them while they're on the ground, you know what turkey vultures will do? They'll <laughs> throw up on that animal. <laughs> and wow. that is, that is one of their defense mechanisms. And do you know how far they can propel their vomit? <laughs> no, I want to know though. <laughs> 10 feet. Really? That's insane. That's so crazy. That's yes. smart though. <clears throat> I know. That's Could you imagine <throat> anytime someone comes up to bother you at school or at work and you just are like, I don't want to deal with this person. I want them to go away. And so <laughs> you just throw up on them. Well, and they're already, honestly, like they're not, I mean, I think they're beautiful animals, but they definitely are intimidating looking. So on top of just kind of the way that they look and kind of bony and skeletal for that to be mm -hmm. another thing that they have is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. honestly. That's I really think, cool. And another, you want to hear another gross thing? Uh, yeah, I'm always about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they are like storks. And I don't know if you knew this about storks but they, both storks and turkey vultures will pee and poop on their own legs. Wow, and they okay. use the evaporation of the water in the feces and the urine to cool uh -huh. themselves down. Wow, so that's actually a, like to regulate themselves, huh? Yep, exactly. So well, yeah, they're local desert animals. It totally makes sense that that would be like a real, I mean, I think that's a superpower in a weird way, like seriously. Totally. It totally is. It's like, um, it's like the suits in Dune. I don't know if you've <laughs> yes. read Dune. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, um, we always appreciate all the things that the animals, like animals have all these really cool things that they can do with their bodies that we, that we can't do, you know? Yeah, it cools their blood vessels because they don't have any feathers on their feet and, um, and so it actually is a really cool adaptation that they have. Um, so, yeah, that's that's awesome. So in terms of I know that we talked about I'm really into folklore, stuff like that. So kind of in sort of imagining what we're doing right now with this bird. Can you tell us a little something, uh, maybe a story that's reflective of like the life of a vulture? Yeah, so we were talking about how they kind of look they look a little bit intimidating. And part of that is because they have that bright red head, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a Lenny Lenape um, uh, myth about why the turkey vultures have red heads. Um, and basically it says that long, long, long time ago, the sun got too close to the earth and the plants started withering and dying and streams were drying up. Um, and so the animals were all afraid that they were going to die from hunger and thirst. So all the animals met up and decided that they needed to put the sun back where it belonged, farther away from the earth. And so they were looking for volunteers to help make this happen. And so the first volunteer was the possum. And the possum was like, I'll do it. And so he, he used his furry tail at the time to wrap it around the sun and try and throw it back into uh, into the sky, but the sun burned off the hair off of his tail. And so that's why opossums have naked tails. <laughs> um, but he didn't accomplish it, that task. So they asked for another volunteer and the next volunteer was a fox. And he said, you know, I can do it. Um, and, he, and he tried to grab the sun with his mouth 
and carry it back to the sky, but it burned his mouth and he dropped the sun and he couldn't do it. Um, but that's why the fox has a blackened tongue and mouth. <laughs> and so they still were looking for someone else to, to do it. And they said, you know, who else wants to volunteer? And so finally, um, this beautiful bird who was widely respected and soared high above all the other birds, um, he was known and famous throughout the creation. Uh, he volunteered to accomplish the task of putting that sun back in the sky. And so he flew up and put his head right up against the sun and pushed it all the way out back where it belonged and used his mighty, mighty wings to flap and flap and push it. And as he pushed it, the sun burned the feathers off of his head and charred all of his beautiful plumage. But he kept on going, he didn't give up, um, and he pushed the sun all the way back where it belonged. And when the bird returned to the earth, the animals drew away from it because they were so scared, because it was it looked really ugly now. Um, but but that's the the story of how the turkey vulture became sort of the way it is now, with no no um, feathers on its face or its head, and that really dark plumage um with the the kind of two-toned like you're drawing um plumage but they also in in this uh native culture that had this myth they really really respect the the turkey vulture because of this because he saved all of creation from from hunger and thirst and getting burnt up by the sun that's so cool see i love these kinds of stories because it's like people trying to make sense out of why the reasons animals look the way they look. And I think that's like really neat. So I added the sun because you made that awesome story. And, and also because I don't know if you guys noticed, there was a little mistake. So I turned the mistake into a sun. <laughs> oh, I didn't even notice. It looks really it cute. Is. Yeah, don't worry, you guys. If you messed up, you can always, people don't know when you mess up. Just remember that. You always got to keep going and just pretend like that was just what you meant, you were meant to do. I think it's like a <laughs> important thing to do in life is just kind of kind of keep it moving um but yeah there was a few little spots there and i thought you you inspired me with the story to add a little sun in there so i thought i would and i decided to change the color because yeah because we're living in a new world today today's not yeah, a new day right so what? um are they really social like do they have you know surprisingly so in the myth right it said that all the other animals withdrew from it and that turkey vultures were now known to be solitary but um but actually they are no while they are kind of keep to themselves as far as other species are concerned um they will soar in groups and roost in larger numbers mm -hmm. um so especially when they're all like, there's a big roadkill or something, um, or like dumpsters they're found around, or if there's a dump or something, the ton of them will be there. And even when I was out in Arizona this weekend, I was so excited. We stopped at the grocery store and I looked up and there was a huge, just like swirling storm of turkey vultures that I saw. I never seen that many. There's probably like 50 of them. Wow, like that. Oh, I've never seen that. So either. excited. Totally. That's really cool. I actually I hope I get to see something like that. That's really neat. I guess this area is a little different. I feel like it's more open, open, a little more spacious. I mean, not that they're probably they probably do that here too, but I don't know. I haven't seen that. I would love to see that, Lauren. Yeah, there's not that usually when I see them around here, there's like maybe between like one and three at a time. But once yeah. you get out driving out away from the city, you'll see them, you'll see a lot more. Yeah, and I like that we're talking about animals that are um, lo kind of local to us, but we don't see them in the same way and kind of less popular animals mm -hmm. that when you see them, you're actually really excited. So how do you like it, Lauren? I love it. Yeah, actually, this is my favorite one. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I hope you guys send us yours because I really want to see your versions of our of my silly designs and stuff. So, okay, so Lauren, off to quail. We're in quail land. Quail land. Off to quail. <laughs> off to quails. Okay, guys, I'm gonna leave it side by side for a little bit and then I'm gonna let it go so you guys can do whatever. And remember to have like a little piece of paper. I totally forgot to tell you guys so you guys can wipe the brushes off. Anyway, so quails. Yeah. So what's up with quails? Do we get a lot of quails at, uh, at, at the shelter? 
Um, we will get some, but usually the quails around here are more like in the um, foothills and stuff. So they they don't really come into the to the city and the urban area too much. We'll get like maybe one turkey vulture a year. So um, and then with quail, we most of the quail we get is is actually domestic quail. So they don't they don't really look quite the same. They're usually like all white or um, just like smaller little like softball looking guys. But these ones that you're drawing, the um, they have that what's called the top knot, which is why I put my hair in top knot today. So I, I didn't match. know that was why. Cool. <laughs> Actually, I just came up with that right now. It was just <laughs> I love fortuitous. It. <laughs> I love it. So that's your top um, knot. Yeah. So those those uh, feathers on their head are called top knots, and while it looks like it's just one feather, it's actually a cluster of six feathers um, that overlap and is on top of the quail's head. Um, and both the male and the female quails have them. Um, the main species I think I named already were are the mountain quail, California quail, and the gambles quail. Um, they usually um, are kind of you know just little bowling ball kind of shaped guys um but they they're ground birds they're kind of like um they're kind of like chickens in that way uh where they just kind of walk around a lot and they scratch the ground looking for um plant material to eat and um sometimes like bugs um and they they travel in big groups called coveys and Thank you. <laughs> and uh and they don't fly too much they can fly but kind of like chickens they kind of just like explode off the ground and fly for a little bit and then they land again mm -hmm. just long enough to like escape any predators um and what are, what are their predators lauren well the ones that live in the foothills and things their predators are going to be things like mountain lions and bobcats oh. and and coyotes and other birds of prey like peregrine falcon and um and other big larger birds of prey um mm -hmm. red tail hawks things like that um yeah. so do you but, yeah. um do you do people have them as pets though is that some a, is people that... do yeah yeah um generally they're a uh, different kind of quail that people can keep as pets. They're usually like a Japanese kind of quail. Oh. Uh, so they're they're a bit different. Um, with these guys, the like native quail, you're not supposed to keep them as pets. Um, they, like, like I said, they play an important role in the food pyramid, not food pyramid, the, what am I, what am I trying to say? The food chain? Food chain. Yeah, the food chain, uh, yeah. And uh, and so so it's important that we leave them where they are. Um, yeah. And you know the California quails are state birds, so that's fun and special. That is. Um, and I mean, that means that there had to have been so many of them, sort of that they represent us in such a way, you know. And it's really cool because we talk about how all these. I mean, in a lot of our watercolor webinars, we've talked about how a lot of animals were actually brought in here um, and they were not, you know, native to our area. So it's cool that we're painting some like legit native animals that are in our world, you know? Our, our legit quail, yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, they, they, they're actually a lot of quail all over the world. Um, yeah. Since we were kind of talking about myths and things, uh, I was looking up what what sort of mythology is around quail? I didn't find too much about like Native myth Native American mythology, but the quail is a sacred bird over in Greece in Greek mythology to Hephaestus yeah. and Artemis, um, and it's a symbol of a contrite spirit, communal love, and higher consciousness. That's so cool that they're all over, and there's just like different versions all over the world, you know. Yeah, they're kind of an interesting study in um, genetic engineering, I suppose. Um, you know what I learned recently, too, was because I was saying they're kind of related to chickens, um, and we were talking about landfowl, 
last time oh, yeah. I was talking to you about how, you know, all the landfowl is kind of related. So like chickens and quail and pheasants and, and peacocks. even peafowl. Yeah, 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 even peafowl. They're all kind of related in the same family. But I looked, I learned the other day that the closest living relative of the T-Rex is the chicken. Whoa, really? Yeah. Did you know that? I no, but you know what? It totally makes sense. Like if I was on Jeopardy and they were to ask me and that and chicken was in the options, I probably would pick chicken. <laughs> totally. They, I mean, and quails are very similar. Um, they just, they look like little dinosaurs. They do look like little dinosaurs. I think it's the claws and stuff too that make them so, so mm -hmm. interesting and scary and kind of creepy, honestly, <laughs> but in a neat way. Like I always love appreciating the, all of the, uh, birds that we talk about now that I know more about them you just kind of go oh it's a bird and it's kind of cute but it's not like you're really paying attention to what they are <laughs> like whatever you know? so this is really neat um do they have how many babies do they usually have oh my gosh they have so many babies they <laughs> um I mean depending on the species they're a little bit different but generally they have like 10 or more eggs at a time and some quail will even uh kind of like offload their eggs in other quails nests so then one quail ends up sitting on like 20 eggs <laughs> wow. and but it, it's okay because a lot of times when um a lot of times when the quails raise their babies they kind of raise them all together so they share responsibilities with like a couple different families of quail That's um, smart. yeah so they have like a kind of like a nursery um for all the baby quail and they're what's called precocious when they're born which is something i think we talked about a couple a couple mm -hmm. uh think a couple webinars ago didn't we talk about that we totally did but for people that don't know what does that mean so if you're if an animal is born precocious it means that they hatch and then within a very short amount of time they're able to walk and feed themselves and um are like already fairly independent um as opposed yeah. to you know human babies or even like vulture babies are born and they're pretty helpless for a while and um until you know they they grow up a little bit but um the quail like it's like the chicken and the and the peafowl they all they're born and then they just kind of pop right up and they're they're ready to go that's so interesting mm -hmm. um and then because why are there so many of them born at a time lauren well that is uh that goes back to where they lie on the on the food chain so um with most prey animals they're going to have a lot more babies because they have a lower chance of actually making it into adulthood so when you're a prey animal you need to have you need to have like 10 or 20 babies because um there's always going to be you know a predator animal that you need to kind of it's kind of like insurance babies right like if one if you have if you only have one and then it gets eaten by a coyote then what are you gonna that's do it. <laughs> that's it yeah it's kind of totally. a harsh reality but it's it's the reality yeah when they're um do they have um like when they communicate how do they communicate uh well actually mount uh california quails they have a very uh distinctive call um and people describe them as as basically sounding like they're saying chicago like chicago <laughs> <laughs> so, so forget about I it why I definitely encourage everyone to go look up YouTube videos of quail calls and they're just like any other bird, you know, they make, they make some noise. Um, they have some songs and actually that reminds me, there's a funny little, um, a funny little fact about, um, about Gamble's quails. That's the desert one. Um, mm -hmm. Just before her eggs hatch, the female will call to the chicks and they cheep to each they cheep to each other from inside their eggs and they talk to each yeah. other and then they all hatch in synchronous in synchronicity they all hatch together at the same time and it's really? so yeah it's so cool because they like talk to each other from within their eggs that's so interesting so they're all wow that's that's so neat that they that they do that together wow that's a trip they're so mm -hmm. like 
communicative even even before they get out. Yeah. Look, my top notch is super stylish on this one. It looks it looks just like mine. I know, I like it. I, that's why I think you inspired me with your <laughs> top notch. I'm going to say that all day now. <laughs> that's really cool. And I didn't do they communicate in other ways? What about when they're um trying to find a mate? You know what? Um they they do little dances for each other kind of like pe you know we think about peacocks right and how they have their big fanned out tails and they try to impress the ladies with it um so quails they don't obviously have a giant train tail but they will still do kind of little dances and movements to try and show off their um their colors to try and get um the females to mate with them uh the mountain quail actually it's it's long little uh top knot head plume will will be uh an indicator of its mood or its attitude so when when it's angled backwards the bird is typically more relaxed or feeding or resting kind of like a dog with its ears down you know it's just kind of chilling um but when the plume sticks straight up it, that means the bird is really agitated or bothered or on alert. So that's another cue of how they will communicate too. And in their in their natural, like in the areas that you said, kind of where they are, where we are like now, are they just eating sort of the bugs and everything too? Yeah, they actually have a very protein rich diet. So they get a lot of protein from their bugs, kind of how well we, we get our protein from, from meat or um, egg material, eggs or other um, animal materials. Uh, so compared to a lot of other birds, they do eat quite a bit of bugs and um, and they also eat like seeds and plant material too from the ground, but just like depends on where they're located, you know, what's available to them. That's so cool. And have we, I know I asked this before, but like we don't get any, we don't really get quails very often, do we? Not very, not the native quails very often, but we do get, um, we do get the domestic ones, um, you know. And those are, those are considered sort of like people actually have them in their neighborhoods, like they actually have them living like the way they, they would have like, uh, like hens and stuff in their, in their yard. Is that how they treat them? Yeah, you, people treat them just like, just like chickens. Yeah, they just lay little tiny eggs. So I know some people who like them in their uh, like noodles and and yeah. like ramen hot pot. They like the quail eggs. Absolutely, that's so interesting though that you can actually do that too. And I know that like certain areas, I've learned this working working where we work is that some areas actually allow so many types of like rooster, like a like hens or roosters in their area versus some areas, you know, don't do that at all. Like they're not allowed to have them in the same way, right? Yeah, it just depends on where you live. You have to check with your local city ordinances and where you're zoned for. Um, so depends. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, it's really cool because I, I, um, I never, I never talk about. We never talk about these kinds of birds, and I, I appreciate us kind of going down this like native. I know last week we were doing parrots and peacocks and talking about they were actually brought over versus these animals are actually are naturally in our environment which is really cool yeah right pretty cool animals yeah i really dig them too they're beautiful and it's nice to make yeah, them yeah you like it yeah yeah i'm happy with this one too i was digging i'm digging my other one too i think they're both really cool but i think I'm digging the purple today and because you gave us that like cool folklore story. So that's really cool. <laughs> it looks really good. How I do you like it? it? Yeah, right? Really cool. So I'm really excited to see what you guys have to offer. I think I'm going to add a little sun too and just make kind of go with the theme. Um, but I know, um, Michelle, do we have any questions from the audience about these awesome animals? Yeah, so how far can vultures see? You said pretty far, but is there? Uh, I don't know. I think that they can see like um at least a couple of miles. They 
they'll usually spot a, a carcass that you know let's say it's a um like a deer or something um out in like the open plains they could probably see it for like from like four miles away but yeah. um but you know it, it also depends on if there's like coverage or what the air quality is like and things like that too like you think about today with the fires and stuff um yeah. it probably makes it a lot harder to see yeah that's insane that's awesome now when they fly are they do they fly in that v formation like geese do that's a good question uh, the ones that i saw they were like circling they tend when you when you see them they're usually circling over something um but they can fly in um they'll they'll fly like 200 miles in a day sometimes if they need to wow. um, they i don't know if, if you guys listening are very familiar with california area but um some research have has been done that shows that they can come from fresno to kern valley which is like bakersfield mm -hmm. area and then continue the next day down to like to hatchapi or victorville which is even mm -hmm. farther and they really don't eat that much during that migration period either they kind of just power through it that's insane wow. that's so cool so and then switching gears to quails why do they have the top knots there are purpose for it uh well i think like i like i mentioned earlier they the mountain quail uses it to kind of communicate how they're feeling like dogs will have their ears perked up when they're alert and then it's kind of like down and relaxed when they're when they're relaxed so that's one reason uh that that they one way that they use that top knot and then also it's just a it's just a part of their plumage and so it's um like with all birds the they have these like more ornate sort of feather coloring and things like the peafowl and, and that's used to um, try and attract mates. Anything for the mate. <laughs> very, very interesting. So, but yeah, that... I mean, I definitely think that um, you guys should always uh practice doing research too because i don't have all the answers i know a little bit about a lot of things but yeah. um but i don't have all the answers for everything i wish i was that smart but i'm not we're getting so, there we're good. <laughs> so i wonder actually if they if they can use their little top knot to like sense changes in the wind and stuff yeah too. So I bet if you did a little bit more research yourself, you might find some more cooler things. That's true, Lauren. And you know what? I really like that we're taking on animals that we may not necessarily get as much in the shelter, but are definitely representative of our environment. So that's why we were really excited about this one because <laughs> it's like not as popular. But then it makes me and Lauren have to learn and, and Michelle as well to kind of understand these really cool animals that we really don't talk about very much. Anything else, Michelle? No, that's all the questions that we have from the audience. Sweet, cool. awesome. Well, thanks you guys for joining us and please make sure to check out the next watercolor in wildlife and also all the awesome stuff that Mich uh, Michelle actually promoted. So check us out at pastingnewhuming.org. Bye you and guys. Send us your pictures. Oh yeah, Let's, we love your pictures. So send us pictures. Right. <laughs> Bye. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Bye, Bye ladies.